welcome to those of you joining us online on this Christ the King Sunday. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from Luke chapter 23, verses 33 to 43. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And if we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, here we are, the last stop of that liturgical calendar. After journeying through a very long time of green during ordinary time, our final destination before beginning that new liturgical year is always Christ the King Sunday. Next week, when we gather back in this sanctuary, we will light the Advent candle. We will sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. But before we anticipate that wondrous birth of Jesus, Christ the King Sunday is an opportunity to observe the end of his life, or more specifically, what the Roman Empire thought would be the end of his life. I like to see Christ the King Sunday as reminding us who we are soon to be welcoming in this tiny baby that will be swaddled in Mary's arms. While Luke's crucifixion scene is really difficult to read and to hear, today we are reminded there is only one King, only one Savior, only one person who can truly save us. Amen. Episcopal priest and very renowned preacher, Barbara Brown Taylor, recalls watching a trio of white crosses spring up on a hillside by a highway, except they didn't really just spring up. Erecting these crosses took some time and it was a long drawn out task for someone. The first time Barbara saw them, as she drove by, it was just three posts that seemed to be coming out of the ground. The next time she passed by, there were cross beams that had been added. A few days later, the crosses were painted white. And then a few days after that, the very middle cross had the purple cloth draped over it. As Barbara Brown Taylor watched this process unfold, she began to wonder, why not just stop at one cross? It had been a lot less work, it had gone faster, and it gets the same message across. Why construct three crosses on the hillside? But then she realized something. One cross is not the same message as three because one cross is a crucifix, three crosses is a church. 
All four Gospels agree that Jesus was not the only poor soul hung up on a cross that day. Each of the crucifixion accounts places him between two others. And like Jesus, they had been convicted of a crime and sentenced to death. So here we are, we're gazing on this horrific scene. It seems to be an all too common scene for the Roman Empire, except that when we zoom in a little closer, when we get close enough to overhear that conversation between Jesus and those two criminals, we discover this scene is really not common at all. While all four Gospels agree that Jesus was not crucified alone, it's only Luke who records the conversation between Jesus and the ones on his left and right. That first criminal derides him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. He's not alone in those taunts, of course. The leaders are scoffing at Jesus as well, and the soldiers mock him. What is surprising is what happens next. Do you not fear God, says the other criminal. We're getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then this condemned criminal looks at the man in the middle, the one hanging under that sarcastic sign that reads King of the Jews, and he pleads, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This plea, one suffering a disgraceful death. And yet, isn't that the deep longing of so many in our world today to be remembered? Is this not the deep longing of those in Jesus' homeland even today who are still facing occupation like their ancestors? facing the plight of food insecurity, and every step they take is under watchful soldiers. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Is this not the longing of our neighbors who make their homes under overpasses, or who move their families from place to place until they can once again afford a roof over their heads? or of those who are loved but are lost to that grip of addiction, who can't seem to break free from opioids or alcohol, or our sisters and brothers who are reeling from a divorce, grieving a diagnosis, or feeling deeply disorientated in a world that they thought they once knew. To some extent, is this not the longing of every one of us? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, the one who came to seek and serve the lost, responds to those criminals hanging beside him as he responds to everyone throughout the Gospels. He responds with mercy. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus responds with forgiveness, compassion, and grace. And above all, he responds with love. Time and again, the power that Christ chooses, he chooses love. As he dines with sinners and tax collectors, as he heals an outcast woman, and he restores her to community as he spins stories of a shepherd scouring the wilderness for that one sheep, or as he tells of the welcoming home of a prodigal. And even now, as he hangs upon a Roman cross, Jesus chooses love. It's a power that the world doesn't really understand. To the leaders who scoff and the soldiers who mock, to the criminal who calls upon Jesus to get them out of that mess, it all looks like weakness. And yet it is a power so threatening that the powers that be 
felt that they needed to crucify it, needed to nail it to a cross, as if the king of love, with a death sentence, that it could be ended. But we know how powerful love is. Three days later, we watch as the one who was mocked by the imperial guard make a mockery of the empire as he rises victorious from the grave. In that moment and for all time, the king of kings and lord of lord shows that love prevails. In the end, love wins. And here's the thing. If we truly believe this, if we truly believe in the power of love, how does that rule our lives? That's a question for us today as we celebrate Christ the King Sunday. If we claim Jesus as the crucified King, the Lord of our lives, how does that allegiance come out as a witness here and now from us? Well, it seems that the conversation we overhear as we stand near that cross might have something to teach us. It teaches us that the church that professes a crucified king cannot shy away from the suffering in the world, but must respond as Jesus does with forgiveness, with compassion, and with grace. We are all called to remember the world seems to have forgotten those who have been pushed to the margins and reduced to objects of mockery. It teaches us that we are set apart as the body of Christ to embody the power that Jesus chooses, that power of love. And as we pray, as we hope, as we work for Christ's kingdom to come here, we are sent to the extent that that promise of Christ comes from us as he says, Today you will be with me in paradise. If we claim Jesus as Lord, then we have to lay claim to the calling of practicing compassion, to remember the forgotten, to offer a glimpse of paradise even in the midst of pain. If we follow a crucified king, then we must be a crucified church. People who pour themselves out in the name of love for the healing world. What was it that Barbara Brown Taylor said? One cross makes a crucifix. Three crosses makes a church. Across our nation, across our world, the lost and the least are still pleading. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Thanks be to God for the church that is already living into this calling amidst all this lost and the least and the forlorn and the forgotten. We see it here. Every time our church hands out food boxes, we see it. Every time our church sends things to the school for the children, we see it. Every time stories are swapped, every time we show up at an assisted living home, every time home communion is served, every time somebody watches or listens online, every time ladies lunch together, we are reminded of God's beloved children right here at this church and how he loves us so much. In all of these things, we strive to proclaim to anyone who know that deep longing, to anybody who has whispered that criminal's plea, in Christ's kingdom, you are remembered. If we follow a crucified king, then we are a crucified church, pouring ourselves out for healing in the world. May we be that community that responds as Christ does, with forgiveness, with compassion, with grace, 
and above all, with love. After all, one cross is a crucifix, but three crosses is a church. In the name of Christ the King, amen. Our final 